Hi everyone. Okay. Uh, so initially what I wanted to do for this video was make a list showcasing my top 10 JRPG town soundtracks. Then I thought, well, why limited to the soundtrack? Why not just rank my top 10 favorite towns in JRPGs? I started doing that, but then I noticed that certain types of games had the obvious advantage. Those being the ones with hub worlds. Hub worlds? Is that what you call them? Maybe sandboxes? Mini open worlds? Uh, anyway, what I mean is games that feature a singular town in which most of the game takes place in. So for this video, I'll be ranking my top 10 JRPG hub worlds and I'll leave the more traditional towns for a later video. Okay, so for a town to qualify as a hub world, either a large chunk of the game's gameplay takes place within this town and or it's the only town within the game. I'm going to be judging these towns based on how they look, what activities you can partake in them, their soundtracks, their story significance, and some degree of personal bias, while still being reasonably objective. And as usual, I'm only going to allow one entry per game. So without further delay, let's start with number 10. Shibuya from Neo The World Ends With You is our first entry. Shibuya is the game's main setting, and pretty much the entire game takes place within the city, with you gradually unlocking new districts within the city as you go through the game. With this fact in mind, it makes sense that the players would naturally form an attachment to the city. I know this place like the back of my hand, and I'm pretty sure that I can navigate the streets of Shibuya on my own in real life right now. Uh, you know, assuming I had subtitles turned on. Content-wise, the city itself doesn't have much to offer other than a buttload of shops. But even with that, the shops themselves are characterized by specializing in specific brands. A lot of restaurants also fill the streets, all of them offering very different options and even have a hidden menu item that you can get if you visit them enough times. So the game does a good job in making the city feel lived in. There's also this wall of graffiti that you can fully customize to your liking. This was a fun little detail that I always enjoyed. In terms of how the city looks, I mean, you can just see for yourself how incredible it looks as does every other thing in this game. As for the music, there actually isn't a single track dedicated to the city itself. In fact, every time you open and close the menu, the song changes. I ended up repeatedly opening and closing the menu just to get the song I liked. Just like this. Music in this game is actually of great significance. They even implement it directly into the gameplay. See, as you're moving around the city, it's beneficial that you move to the beat of the song that's currently playing. And the city itself, I feel, is designed around this mechanic. So yeah, I'll always remember the times where I'm just grooving and moving through the streets of Shibuya. My next entry is Balduk Prison City from East 9 Monstrum Nox. Now, Balduk might not be the most visually appealing setting for a game, mainly because, well, these games aren't exactly known for their graphical achievements. It makes up for what it lacks visually with the amount of collectibles and secrets placed all around the city. I actually think that exploring Balduk is the best thing that this game has to offer, and it's mostly thanks to the incredibly satisfying traversal options at your disposal. See, whenever the game adds a new member to your party, you also get a new skill that helps with traversal. You can swiftly zip around between different points like using a grappling hook, you can run up walls, glide through the air, go underground, and you can even activate a kind of third eye to find secrets and hidden switches. Other than traversal, however, the city itself is kinda basic with what it offers, mostly only consisting of shops and the like. As for the music, the song playing changes multiple times throughout the course of the game, and all of them are decent and are a nice fit to the city, I feel. There is one portion of the city that gets its own unique song, and that's Shantytown, the part of the city that's mostly occupied by the less fortunate. The song that plays here is a perfect fit, and you really get that sense of dread for the people living there through the music. It makes me wish that other parts of the city had unique music as well. Don't underestimate music, it really can make or break our perception of a particular setting, and it also helps in making these settings much more memorable. Despite some shortcomings, I really ended up forming quite an attachment to this city. Once I got this game's platinum, I felt compelled to make it all the way up to the highest point in Balduk and admire it one last time before saying goodbye. Number 8 is Radiata City from the game Radiata Stories. This town is so important they named the entire game after it. For those that don't know, this is a PS2 action RPG made by Triace. Uh, think of it as like another take on the Star Ocean series. Before talking about this one, I should mention that it has been at least a decade since I last played this game and that I don't actually have the means to play it at the moment, so I'm only going off of memory and some gameplay videos I found on YouTube. 
Now, Radiata City is possibly one of the most lived-in cities found in JRPGs. It features a day and night cycle, and every single character that lives here has a certain daily routine or schedule. And if you didn't know, you can actually recruit over 100 of these residents to your team if you fulfill certain conditions. It features an excellent roster of characters, you know, like, uh, genius. But, and, uh, <laughs> Thanos. <laughs> Some of these requirements are pretty goofy, like this one where you want to recruit Cornelia, a little magical girl that transforms into a whole ass woman every night. To recruit her, you have to follow her into a dark alleyway and catch her mid-transformation. She will then join the party in compensation for keeping your mouth shut. Shibuya and Balduk didn't really have residents, or unique residents at least, which is why they're lower on the list. I think that a town's residents are almost a part of the town itself. If the residents are likable and goofy, the town's atmosphere becomes likable and goofy as well. And speaking of Goofy, are you listening to the theme playing right now? This game's atmosphere is seriously like no other. The city is divided into four towns, each having its own distinct theme, which is exactly what I wanted from Balduk. Also, did I mention that you can just go around randomly kicking people in this game? I just thought I should mention that. I really wish I remember more from this game, because I genuinely believe that it deserves higher than 8th place. I just don't remember the details well enough to justify it. On a list of games I want remastered, this is definitely one of them. Next up is Moromiya City from Toku Xanadu, an action RPG by Falcom that borrows a lot of elements from the East and Trail series. Unlike Balduk from East 9, Moromiya City actually has very appealing scenery all throughout. Every area of the city feels distinct and the same goes for the shops. I really appreciate the little details that go into every shop, as you can see the products they have on display. You can even find a copy of East 8 Lacrimosa of Dana available only on the... <laughs> Sani PlayStation. It's a small thing, but it adds so much. The shops don't just look different, each specializes in unique types of items, from gifts, food, recipes, or accessories. There are tons of shops in the city, and the game incentivizes you to explore every nook and cranny. There are also a number of activities you can partake in, such as the skateboard minigame at the park. The minigame sucks ass, mind you, but I mean, I appreciate that it's there. At least it's better than Final Fantasy VII's. There's also an arcade with a number of games available, and the games there range from pretty fine to a complete insult to your fucking time. Whoever thought this fishing minigame was a good idea deserves a special place in hell. But it's a thought that counts, I guess. One final thing of note is, of course, the residents. While you can't recruit them to your party like in Radiara, the game gives a name and profile to almost every single person you interact with in the city giving them a sense of significance. That of course includes shopkeepers, teachers, students, and random pedestrians. Trying to collect all their profiles is kind of a pain cause Falcom has this problem with making everything missable. So I hope they ease up on that aspect if they ever plan to make a sequel. Otherwise, I'd love to visit Moromiya City for one more game. Next up is Feneth Island from Rune Factory Oceans or Rune Factory Ties of Destiny, depending on where you're from. And holy crap, just listening to this music reminds me of simpler times. The appeal of every Rune Factory and Harvest Moon game is the town and the town's residents. And this entry, in my opinion, offers the best town in the series. Firstly, in terms of looks, I'd say that this game's town looks way more distinct compared to the towns of the more recent entries in the series. From the architectures to the town's layout, it's definitely the one I enjoy walking around in the most, and certainly somewhere I'd love to live in. Here's how a typical day on Feneth Island looks like. You wake up, ideally at 6am. If you happen to have the equipment for it, you can spend some time crafting some accessories or cooking some food to offer to the townspeople. Oh, and uh, time doesn't move when you're indoors, by the way. You go outside and greet all the residents, who each have their own schedule, and offer them their favorite gifts. Mikoto, the island's guard, for example, will always be practicing their swordplay outside the end in the morning, which is kind of sus, not gonna lie. And know that there is always new dialogue available for everyone, so doing this every day doesn't get old anytime soon. As you're doing that, you view the quest board at the end since it happens to be close by, and accept the ones you're planning to do for the day. Once you're done greeting everybody, you go back to your farm, check up on your farm animals, and do a little bit of farming. Once you're done, you do some dungeon exploring, or complete a few quests, and you're gonna lose a lot of energy doing that, so to recover it, you go back to the island and quickly race into the bathhouse, cause it closes at 3pm. That's another thing, every single facility has an opening and closing time. You go back to exploring, and once you're done, you submit your finished quests, go to bed, and do that all over again tomorrow. Unless there's a festival, of course. Yes, on certain days, events take place within the island, such as a cooking contest, Harmony Day, where you give chocolates to everyone, which is essentially Valentine's Day, and there's even a Miss Feneth contest where everyone votes for the most attractive girl, which whoever you decide to vote for will coincidentally always be the winner. 
you're probably rigging the boats, let's be real here. So yeah, Fenneth Island is a delightful little town which I'm sure everyone wouldn't mind living in if we had the chance. Next up is Ahimama port from Way of the Samurai 4. Now while it's not the most traditional, I think this game has enough RPG elements to qualify being on this list. If you haven't heard of this game, well, I wouldn't blame you cause well, the scores weren't that great. Which isn't too surprising cause this game's all kinds of weird. And it's sort of like a guilty pleasure game for me that I keep coming back to time and time again for some reason. I do think it's primarily due to the town of Ahima. I keep saying it wrong. It's Ahimama. Uh, what, wait, is it Amihama? Amihama? What the fuck? Uh, okay, sorry. So apparently it's Amihama. Okay, let's try that again. I do think it's primarily due to the town of Amihama and how your decisions throughout the story affect the town itself. From new shops opening up to only certain areas being accessible to opening up a school which somehow allows all the British foreigners in town to suddenly become fluent in Japanese overnight. Before when you talk to them they just hit you with the huh? This game takes place during mid 19th century Japan a few years after the British Navy came into contact and have pretty much settled in. And the main goal of the game is to unite the three factions within the town. The government forces who reside in the magistrate, the anti-government forces who reside in a dreary cave in the back roads, and the British Navy officials who reside in a fancy pansy area called Little Britain. You know, away from all the peasants. At least, that's the best outcome. There are a ton of paths and endings in this game and you can side with whomever you so choose. There are a ton of activities you can do in this town. You can go fishing, gamble at the British casino where everyone calls you up. <laughs> an unsightly Japanese barbarian and make fun of you for not understanding poker. You then leave in tears and go to the Japanese gambling parlor and cry in real life cause I can't for the life of me figure this shit out. Uh, but let's see, what else can you do? Uh, you can steal this old man's dojo and start beating people up just to convince them to become your students. And if they refuse, they kick you in the balls and run away because of course they do. And of course, you can pick up women by telling them they have a nice ass and sneaking into their bed sheets at night. Oh, okay, okay. You know what? No, I'm not doing this. Okay, what the fuck is this? We all know what that turtle's supposed to mean, by the way. You're not being discreet, game. <clears throat> uh, okay, uh, this seems important. Let's see here. Uh, how to have sex in the way of the Samurai 4. This video goes over all the details on how to have sex with just about any girl in the way of the Samurai 4. Bear in mind, some unique story characters may require unlocking more resources, but they can also be charmed. That includes the ch- up next is the countryside of Inaba from Persona 4. It's no surprise that anyone would form quite an attachment to Inaba cause firstly you never leave this town in this game and secondly almost everything about it is just inherently lovable. Unless you're a city snob of course. Simple is the key word here cause there really isn't much to do here. As is the nature of Persona games there is no side content, rather you could argue that the side content is the main content. After all, exploring the town as you decide on your next course of action for the day makes up about 50% of the game's gameplay. This of course includes shopping, completing quests, catching bugs, fishing, raising social stats, working at the bar, and of course, hanging out with friends. And let's be real here, the characters are the main reason the players end up loving Inaba. We love this town because our favorite characters do so as well, and sometimes it really is just that simple. All the characters problems begin and end within the town of Inaba and all of them end up realizing just how much this little town means to them by the end. And plus, my little sister Nanako lives here as well so you bet your ass I feel right at home in the pleasant town of Inaba. You know, minus the corpses hanging on poles. I could do without those. Alright, we're at the top 3, and at 3rd place I have Flotia from Digimon World Next Order, an actual sequel to the original Digimon World on the PS1. Now, Flotia is special in regards to one thing. It's the only town in JRPGs I'm aware of that you gradually see building over time. Initially it starts off looking like the original File City, with not much going on, it even has the same relaxing music. As you recruit more Digimon to live in town, the town keeps getting bigger and bigger, and it's honestly one of the most satisfying experiences in any game ever. Being rewarded in different ways for every little thing you do goes a long way. You start out with nothing but a small gym and a playground, you then get a farm, a storage, a shop, a transport station, and more and more and more, until this becomes this. Remember the farm? Look at it now. Remember that crappy gym? Look at it, it's $80 per month looking ass now. The city is so big now that it's divided into districts, each sporting a completely different look. The central district looks all Japanesey now and includes your main base, the storage, the transport station, and there's now a building station filled with the best Digimon engineers and it's where you go to upgrade the rest of the city. Now over at the business district, which looks more European inspired, 
as is some item shops, a hospital, a fancy restaurant, and you've got Edimon out here responsible for the stock market where you buy and sell and hope that your stocks increase in price, but it never fucking does. But when it does work out eventually, it really is the best way to make some easy cash. Next is the research district, now all industrial looking, which houses the gym, a lab, and a dojo. Explaining what each of these do would take some time, so moving on, cause we're still not done. Next is the entertainment district, which is basically a casino. It even changes the music to a jazzier rendition of the File City theme. Here you have an arcade, a coliseum, a museum, a number of fishing spots, and a little place you can send Digimon out for treasure hunting. And I'm still not done, there's also the agricultural and dimensional districts, but I assume you get the point by now. Now, Floaty as a town I actually considered for first place, but these next two entries are very special to me personally, so I had to give it to them. At second place, I have Tatsumi Port Island and Iwato Dai City from Persona 3. Yes, technically these are two different places, but they are treated as being one and the same in the game. Okay, this city is essentially just a better looking Inaba. I mean, lo look how gorgeous this place is. While it is an urban area, it isn't that overdeveloped, so that cozy feeling we get from Inaba isn't completely diminished. In fact, the nicest looking place here would definitely be Polonia Mall, which is just a small open circle with multiple shops lined up. It's most definitely inspired by Odaiba's Venus Fort. There's an arcade, an antique shop, a nice looking coffee shop, and of course, a nightclub where you meet one of your social link buddies. Gekukan High School is also my favorite school in the Persona series since it looks very polished and isn't that big, it's really hard to get lost here. And this rooftop is a very special place for multiple reasons. The two stations are also very nice to look at, there's also this one security guard who's really obsessed with one of the stations and gets really upset if you don't agree with them. And I mean, I see where he's coming from. And of course, I present to you my second home, the Iwato Dai Dorms, which just feels like the coziest place ever, and it helps that you're living here with all your friends, all day every day. Now, while the game doesn't hammer home just how much the characters love this town like Persona 4 does, I still feel like they do subconsciously. The reason for fighting is a question asked time and time again in this game, and for our protagonist, who's lost his parents and is an only child, this town and the people residing in it are all he has, and they are certainly the reason why he, and in turn the player, are risking their lives in battle to protect this precious town. This town is the reason why I added the personal bias condition for this video, cause if I'm being real, this is my favorite hub world in any game ever, even though I'm not the biggest fan of the song played here and I even think that Flotia has it beat in terms of content. I did promise to be objective as well however, which is why I couldn't have it be first place, since if we're talking about sandboxes and RPGs, there is one game, or series rather, that has a clear advantage, and that series is... That's right, my pick for the number one best town in a JRPG is either Kamurocho or Yokohama from the Yakuza series. I'm kind of cheating here by having two of them, but I'll explain in a second. This should come as no surprise to those familiar with the series, unless you're the kind of person who still thinks that these games are some kind of GTA clones. And yes, I do consider the entire series to be comprised of JRPGs, not just Yakuza 7, which was a lot more traditional. Which is why I'm a bit torn on which city to give first place, Kamurocho or Yokohama. On one hand, I've known Kamurocho longer, and I've seen it evolve ever since I played Yakuza 3, then Yakuza 4, then 5, and then I've seen it devolve in Yakuza 0, and then back to 6 and 7, and not to mention the two Judgment games. Hell, I even saw this town survive a zombie apocalypse at one point, which was very painful to see the first time around. Which is weird, cause horrible crap happens every single second in this town, what with all the Yakuza and thugs running around. But strangely, that's not what I remember this town for. This place is home to some of the best characters in video game history. Kiryu, Akiyama, Majima, Saijima, Daigo, Ichiban, and so, so much more. At this point, we've been through so much in the city over the years from the point of view of so many different characters that it's only natural to feel attached to this city, even though I'm getting sick of it by now. On the other hand, we've got Yokohama, which was introduced in Yakuza 7 and was a breath of fresh air for the series, and was the first time Kamurocho was not the center of attention. Yokohama was much bigger and had much more delightful scenery. You'll initially be boxed in a small section of the city and slowly uncover it through exploration. Yakuza 7 did a wonderful job setting the scene as you got to know the inhabitants and the various factions within the city. You got to know the homeless people, the various goofy side characters and sub-stories, and the Japanese, Chinese, and Korean criminal organizations controlling the city from the shadows. And the same is of course true for Kamurocho. And man, don't even get me started on the activities you can do in each city. If I had to talk about those, we'd be here all day. Heads up though, as this spot is looking to be replaced by Hawaii with the release of Yakuza 8 next year, and I honestly can't wait to see how they're going to top Yokohama in the next entry, 
uh, you know, after I'm done with my 11th playthrough of Persona 3 Reload. That's it from me. Feel free to drop your own favorite hub worlds or towns or wherever in the comments below. And if you've played the Yakuza series, let me know which do you think deserves the number one spot. Is it Kamurocho or Yokohama? Also, please consider subscribing for more gaming content just like this. Uh, I'm really enjoying making top 10 lists at the moment. Uh, so thank you so much for watching and see you guys next time. Peace.